Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope everyone is well. And I hope, sorry. It's just repeating myself. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I was saying good morning, everyone. And I hope um, you're well and you're all ready for this session on Shapeshift Opus 3. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because, as you probably know already, I have um, I have created a, a PDF of guidelines, um, the 10 essential guidelines on um, Shapeshift Opus 3, just to help my students and anyone else who struggles through this book. It's an excellent book, but I think it needs some guidelines. So I made those guidelines and I also made a course about it, which I'm going to talk more about it later. But for now, I just wanted to say welcome. And if there's anybody here, please write in the comments so I can see that you are here. And again, this is a session. It is not about me telling you how um, these wonderful books works, but more about trying to help out if there's any comments, any questions, any challenges that you might have. Um, that could be, you know, really useful. Um, because then this becomes more of a conversation and not just me talking all the time about what's happening and what's happening. Um, so I'll just, um, what we're gonna do today, we're gonna work on the first 15 um, variations of Sheptic Opus 3. So if, this, if you're working on those variations at the moment or if you're teaching them to students or if you want to have a really good base, the first 10, 15 variations are the most important ones to start with. Um, and actually to start with, um, I would like to start with a warm up. Um, just in the way that, you know, we warm up the body before we do any sport, we also want to warm up the body before we play. And straight after the warm up, if you could also get your instrument, that would be great. So if you play the violin or you play the viola, especially, um, it's going to be relatable to what I say. If you play another instrument, obviously, the, this life is not so much for you directly, but you might get some ideas anyway. So just try to get some your body moving a little bit so that you have, um, you know, all your articulations are nice and warm up so that you don't start from cold. I know it's, at least in the in this hemisphere is spring, early summer, so it's not as cold, but still we want to make sure that the body is ready before we start. Um, we're going to be using lots of fingers and lots of um, wrists for this um, Shepsi Cobra 3, so make sure that those are really well oiled, let's say, so that, <coughs> sorry, so that when we play, it's all nice and flexible and ready. Um, the idea that we need to use the fingers and we need to use the flexibility of the wrist um, goes um, to a certain degree, you know, much, much more important in this because we need to actively move the fingers. So exercises like this could be really useful to warm up the fingers, but also to be aware of the movement of it. Um, other ones we can do is just stretching and curling, including the thumb. You can do it with both hands, but obviously it is the bow hand that we're gonna be talking more about today. And the wrist as well, just going up and down. When we play, obviously it's not gonna go just up and down, it's gonna go a little bit pronated. It's like looking at your watch, and then from there, up and down. Many, many of these, um, Variations will start from the hand. So we need the hand to be very active in this case. So now that we've done a good warm up and we feel like we are ready to start, I would say that the beginning, the, the, the very first thing we would like to do is to warm up uh, with the theme of these 40 variations. So I'm just got my violin. So I would always start um, practicing this Shepsi Cobus 3 with the theme um, because it's a little bit like a warm up for our ears as well. 
Um, if you come from the world of Suzuki, you would understand this as a tonalization in many ways. So um, treat this like a tonalization, uh, something for you to listen if it's in tune, um, to, to get the contact with a string and just check how flexible we're feeling and how soft. So that's obviously the, just the theme, and <clears throat> what we're going to be doing now is um, we're going to talk about how even in the theme we can start using the finger and the wrist. So every time we have a string crossing, um, in the usual, in the basic way, we use the arm to change the string crossing, whether it's going down to the elbow and going up with the wrist or any other techniques that you might use. But when we want a very smooth change, we can use the fingers just like this to do the string crossing. So a good exercise to do is to put the bow on the bridge where we, not, we don't normally play. And without moving up and down, we're just going to push the finger down, straighten it, and then we're going to curl them back. And when we do this, you can see how the bow it's changing strings just by using the fingers, nothing else. So this is a very good way to understand how we can use the fingers to do string crossing in a very smooth way, especially when it's very small changes. Like for example, the beginning we have, we go to the D string. So to make it very smooth, we can use the fingers to help. And then back. And we just curl the fingers, especially the pinky. So we are already working on the fingers, warming them up before we start the variations. That's why. I insist we always do the theme first because the theme, as much as it seems easy, and it is easy in many ways compared to all the other variations, is a great way to understand how to work on this in a very basic level. Also, um, it will help us to check whether we're getting better at what we're already doing. If, the more we practice the Shepshik variations, the better this theme is going to sound. So if you do it on a regular basis, you're going to see how it improves. Um, now we're going to go to the first variation. Uh, before that, I just wanted to um, just share with you, if you don't have it just yet, you got the link in the description of this, of this YouTube live. Um, but basically, um, I don't know if you can see this now. Here is the PDF of the 10 essential guidelines. Now, the idea of this PDF is very simple. It's basically going through the going through the principles in a very basic way. So you know, some you have some like a booklet that will help you go along the the different variations and how to approach them. So, for example, apart from a brief introduction on who's Shepshikin and also about me. Um, here we have the 10 essential guidelines. So the very first one is to read very carefully the instructions 
of the book of Shep, of Shep Shep Over 3, because it tells you exactly what to do in every single variation. And if you're not sure, you can go back uh, and double check what those, um, what it means FR, for example, if you look at variation one, we got the FR here. Now, what does it mean FR? It means frog. Frog, you can see here. You go to a page before that, and you can see all the abbreviations. And frog means basically playing at the heel of the ball. So that's something that we're going to be working on today. But it's just, it's very really important to hear, to listen, and to read carefully what it says in the book, because in the book, it tells exactly what, how to do everything, where to do everything, and in, in, in different ways, like whether you have to lift the ball or not. So we're going to start with the first variation now. Um, again, this is possibly one of the simplest ones, but it's really important to get it correct. Otherwise, we won't be able to continue uh, with the other ones. Um, just to have a look at this, uh, at the PDF that you have over here, um, the next thing is to do it on open strings. So we have this. So I would do it first in open strings. Just to get the bowing without worrying about the fingers. So at the heel, just with the fingers, we're going to move the bow and then lift. Fingers, lift on the D, lift on the A, and again. You see, in this way we can really work on those fingers without having to worry about intonation, without having to worry about changing notes. So we start with that. This lift, active lift with the fingers, we take off. The fingers help to take off. Now, another thing that is super important and I haven't mentioned yet is the level of the hand and the level of the arm. When we play even the first variation, the uh, theme, anything like this, your bow arm is very much in the same level as the bow on the string. Now, if we're going to play off the string like we are for this kind of music, for this kind of variations, we need to lift. We don't need to be on the string, we need to lift. So if you have your violin with you, your viola with you, this is a very good moment to try this because we don't want to be on on the ground. We don't want we don't want to be on the on the string. We actually want to be lifted from the string. So let's just try that one more time. We are on the string and we lift up. This is super important. Even if you are already good at this, this is gonna make a big difference because. From here, we can use the fingers in a mat in a different way. And later on, when we go to number two, etc., and we have spigatos, we want to definitely go from the air and then we drop the bow onto the string. Okay, so let's go back to number one. Again, we're on the string, we lift it, we're gonna be off the string at the beginning, even though the bow is on the string. Does that make sense? The arm is level up, but the bow is on the string. And then we lift. Again. So every time you have one of those little commas in the book, it means to lift. For the whole piece. So it's always the same idea. We lift the arm and then from there, lift with the fingers, lift, lift. Why so much fingers? Why do we need the fingers so much? We could do it without the fingers. We could just do the same thing, but the sound is not the same. And also at the heel, we need to use a lot more of this. Once we get 
to the middle of the bow. Your fingers have to work less. But here the heel, um, there's a lot more work to do. One of the reasons is because it's heavier the heel, but also because of the angle of your arm. You, you're a bit more restricted here than you will be later on. So we need to use more fingers. And of course, to get that that sound, we need to use the fingers to lift it. Right, so that's for number one, and it's gonna be the same for a few other ones. That's why I spent a bit more time on this first one. Number two is in the middle of the bow. It doesn't say that, but spiccato is normally between the balance of the bow and a little bit higher in the middle, depending on the speed. But for now, let's just say around the middle. So. Okay. So it's again an E minor, so we don't have to worry about the keys, but let's just do it without the fingers first. So first is on the D string. I'm just gonna take this out so that you can see me better. So when we have this, don't worry about which strings you're playing for the moment. It's just getting the movement right. So again, we are off the string. The bow is above the string, just flying. And then we drop the bow with the fingers and the arm. The arm does this circular movement. It's very important to speak either, to do circular movement. And the fingers are just helping to drop the bow and to catch it back. Now, why is it important to do circular movement? If we don't do circular movement, if we do it vertical, it just doesn't sound the same. In fact, if it's completely vertical, we're just approaching the string from above or with the fingers. And that's a really good exercise, especially for jeté later on. But for spiccato, we want to have this circular movement, including the fingers. So I would try it also without the instrument. We go down with the fingers, stretch, up, curly, down, stretch, up, curly, down, stretch, up, curly, down, stretch, up, curly. And you can see we get even sound. That's another really important thing. It's really easy to get a double being heavier. No. Try to keep it as much as possible um, even, even in sound. Right. So we got this. Um, and now we're going to try it with the music. Because the good thing is, the way that Chepchik wrote it is Super interesting because it's got different string uh, crossings. Up bow, down. Okay. Um, and then later on it goes. But it's always uh, it's always the same the same idea of the spiccato. I think I should also mention <laughs> that it's very really important that we have all those um, we have all these movements really exaggerated at the beginning because later on when we play for real, the movements are gonna be smaller. You know, even the fingers movements, even the arm movements. Still happening, but it's very small. Okay, so as an exercise, let's make it obvious and then we can scale down afterwards. Right, let's move on to number three. It's pretty much similar to one plus two. So in this case, we start on the string, um, like you can see the lines on top of the, of the notes, and then on the second note we lift, and then we have the jeté, which again, jeté means it's like dropping the, the bow.
the thing is will again help you to throw the bow and to catch it back catch it back catch it back so we practice this first as this is the new thing to do it's like one of the single spiccatos but a lot more vertical than the spiccato also it's got this kind of circular movement to it small circles Excellent, good. So um, if, you, if you can try it, um, that's the next thing. When it's on the string, which is middle, by the way, um, when you're on the string, you need to play loud, forte. Then very quiet. Then on the string. Make sure you land. Land. Then, sorry, I didn't do that properly. It goes all the way to the heel, so then goes back to the middle. Good. So I don't know if you have any questions already. Remember that you can always write any questions about any of it, and I will try to address it later. Um, more than anything, because then we have some, some more of a conversation, like I was saying. So if you have any challenges, especially with these first two that I was talking about, or first three variations, sorry, um, it could be useful because then I can, in real time, re um, answer your questions. So it becomes a little bit like a lesson, uh, but it's a lesson that is not just for you, it's for everyone who might be going through this process. That's the idea of this YouTube Live, anyway. Um, okay, um, I'm going to continue with number four. Number four is one of my favorites. It goes back to the hill which is, the heel is one of those areas of the bow that we don't use very much. And it's a, it's a pity because it's got so much potential and so much power. And it's so heavy that we actually need to make sure that we take the weight off. So that's why it's super important to work on this Shepsi Copper 3 at the heel. Don't do it here. It's very different than uh, practicing at the heel. Now, it is one thing it doesn't tell you straight away um, in, in this variation four, but the first eight bars are all on the G string. So there is the, the shifting, but it's easier to think it's all on the G string. So we want to create that sound on the G string. It's forte. Again, remember, we're not on the string, otherwise we're not going to be able to do this. Your arm needs to be lifted above the string. Your fingers stretch down to the string, so we are on the string. And then we... It's like plucking the string on an apple. With the fingers. We go from stretch fingers to curly fingers. I would try this enough times to feel comfortable. Once you feel comfortable, then we can do two in a row. maybe even three, like it's written. And then on the string, we're going to go circle the other way around. But again, your elbow is always on a higher level. We're not on the string level. We are above the string for the whole, for the whole of this variation, most of the variations. So we create circles going up in one direction. Uh, in my case, it feels clockwise for you. It should look anti-clockwise, but when you're playing, it should feel clockwise. And then the dumbbells is anti-clockwise. Again, we use the hand, we use the whole of the arm, and we use the fingers. Okay, so it's a combination. The arm is not doing very much. Most of the most of the movement comes from the hand. But the arm needs to follow. Good. Later on it goes into different strings. But it's the same idea. So, 
this is the idea for number four. So this I find with my students that um, it takes some time to get used to this um, circle action at the frog because more than anything, we're not used to playing so much at the, at the frog. So I would spend extra time on, on those ones as much as you can. Great. Let's go to number five, and then we have a, a little break. Um, so number five is quite different from the other ones before, and I think it's complementary very complementary very well because it's a whole bow. The G meaning whole bow. We use the whole bow. We lift in the middle. Lift. You see how when we get to the heel, the fingers need to be active. Thankfully, we've been working on it, so we know how to do that. And for the whole bow, we just need to have that go to the middle, lift. Again, in this case, we start on the string level, and we're going to lift the whole of the arm when we go to the middle. Obviously, that's too much. For those who've been doing, who know the Suzuki repertoire, and you might have gone through book four, um, it's the same idea as side one. You probably know this piece anyway. So you start on the string, lift. It's exactly the same here, just using the whole bow. That's for the whole, the whole piece. It's got some harmonics. And oh yeah, that's another thing. Because it's a um Shepsik it in the older older strings, you get to practice what the what this new higher level of of arm is in different strings. So on the Jishin, for example, it feels like this. On the dishing, it feels like this, and on the ace string, this, and the e string, this, and also going from one to the other, or oh. on the string, lift. See how we go to the G to the B, B to the G. So things like that. That's why it's very important to don't play just the first four bars. Play the entire, the entire variation. Another thing that um, I insist with my students very much is that they treat this um, Shepsik Opus 3 not like exercises only, but actually like real music. Because it sounds very much like real music, it's, it's very nicely written in a way that it has a tune and it's got um, some really interesting uh, musical features in it in some way. And each one is very individual. So if you approach it like real music, it will be much easier to later use these skills into any other piece that you are playing, concertos, sonatas, um, whatever you're playing at the moment. Um, whenever you have those lifted bow strokes, it will be much easier to use them because this is already music in many ways. It's not just a mechanical exercise. That's why I love Shepsik Kupusri so much. There are other Shepsiks that are really useful, but they're more exercise and they eventually get quite boring. So it's, it's it's quite good to just, um, yeah, enjoy them, enjoy them as pieces they are. Right. So, um, since I don't see any comments yet, I will continue. And I'm going to go to number six. Um, now, number six and number ten is slightly different, but it's continuing with the same ideas that we had before. If you like this kind of, um, the way that I look at Shepsik Kupus 3, you can go into my course and there's a, even more uh, on how to work on this um, different levels and how to work on the fingers and all that. Right. Number six starts in the middle, starts on the, on the string, and it starts forte. So 
you got one bar of forte on the string with accents and then as soon as you start the next bar is spiccato of the string okay so in in some ways it means that one bar is in the string one bar is of the string one bar is on the string one bar is of the string so we're practicing getting from the string to off the string and then back on in a very clear way because each bar is one of each lift on the string now the beginning of the of the piano it will be on the string and then lifting If we're starting on, if we're starting with open strings, just can you see? Even when I'm on the string, I'm using quite a lot of fingers. I'm exaggerating again, but the idea is that we get the legato that we get from um, finger action. Not much at, apart from this. Uh, obviously, there's a chord at the end, but <laughs> I'm sure that's you know how to play chords already. So I will play two and two. Again, it's a very good moment to use the fingers to do string crossing and chords. Good. Number seven continues with what we did in number five: whole bow. So in some ways it's like reviewing the same skill, but in this case also has what we wrote in number four. That skill of being at the heel of the string. So again we start on the string, lift, lift. Ah, I forgot to mention as well. That we have been changing keys now. So variation six was in A major, so it's just that extra sharp, making sure it isn't here, like the two sharps. And then variation seven goes back to D minor, and obviously is a different soundscape. So we need to get used to it. If we need to, we can always do a scale, and we can do the scale of the string. We can do. To get used to that bowing as well. There's many many ways we can do it. We can just do the variation we did before. You see, the important thing is that we repeat those skills that we have. Those skills that we're working on, we repeat them as much as possible. So using scales is another great way, as much as it is to do open strings. Um, we also need to talk about balance. Um, we're going to go to number eight again. As in, we're going to go to number eight now, which is again at the heel. And the balance of the heel, um, balance is always something to do with, in the case of the bow, to do with the bow hold and how we are able to push and pull those fingers. So at the heel, like we said, it's super heavy because um, we have the whole of the bow um, to hold. And at the same time, um, the heel of the bow is a lot heavier than the tip. So we need to find a balance that is nice and light. In this case, we continue with uh, on the string first, off the string. Having a balance on the string, having the balance off the string is very different because on the string the bow is holding the bow. Whatever we are, the bow is holding the bow. We don't need to do very much. As soon as we lift the bow, we actually need to balance it with, especially with the pinky, also with 
the following finger, the ring finger. Those two fingers with the thumb are possibly the ones that have to work harder when we are off the string, especially the little pinky. That's the one that is working the most. It's also the one that moves the most when we do um, uh, finger, finger action. So it's really important that we have the pinky really nice and warmed up before we start and that we are really aware how we work on it. If, we, if our pinky is straight, none of this is going to work. If the thumb is straight, none of this is going to work. We need to have it curly, both of them, because then we can extend them. Let's see if I can show you. We can extend it and curl it. But if it's like this to start with, there's nothing we can do. So it's really important that we have those fingers curly so that we can stretch them. So again, going back to balance, if the bow is off the string, like we said, on the string, and then we go off the string with the wrist a bit higher than the hat, and then here, we need to find this new balance. So if we are at the heel, or if we are in the middle or the tip, how does this balance feel different from when we are on the string, completely different. Okay, but you actually need to feel it. It's not about knowing it, it's about feeling it. And the more we play this, the more we can feel it. So again, number eight, even though this starts on the string, I would lift the arm up because we want this to be light. And we're going to lift it to have the speaker to reach. This one is not only the G string, but it starts there. So again, it's a different strings, balance with the different strings as well. Right. We're going to go to number nine. Number nine has very much um, the same idea of traveling bow that we had in number five and seven. But in this case, a little bit more concrete, exactly what we need to do. So the first one is to the tip to the middle. Then we go in the middle and we go lift. So the first two notes are actually on the string. Lift. Start on the string, let me go. Lift. So we lift the whole arm. We lift with the fingers. Excellent, good. Um, there's a funny thing about this one, which is at the beginning is the whole bow. Mezzo forte, but at the end, the last eight bars, it goes into pianissimo and it goes to only the upper half. So it's an extra challenge. Start at the tip, middle, or middle half, top half, sorry. Go to the middle. How different is the balance when we lift here and land on the middle compared to when we do it near the balance point at the heel? It's a completely different balance, so it's really, really interesting to do it both ways. So that's why I think Shevchik was a genius in this case. How is different this from? So I would, if I were you, I would try it. How does this feel compared to the whole bow? And it's not 
just about playing it louder or softer. It's about how does it feel differently and how it sounds different. Because then when we apply it to other music, we want to have those skills to say, actually, I want to play it with a more special sound. I want to play it more delicately. Then I'm going to use the top. Oh, sorry, I just, I just saw your message. Uh, do you have the pinky sitting on top of the ball for all of this? That's a very good question, actually. Um, <coughs> so, I don't know if you mean on top of the ball, like right on top, um, or a little bit on the side. If that's a question, mine isn't completely on the top, it's on the inner facet of the top, if that makes sense. So, I don't know if you can say it like this, but it's not completely on top, it's on the inside. So that's one thing. If we are talking about having the pinky on the bow, that's um, something else that's to do with balance. Um, we need the pinky whenever we are off the string all the time, because otherwise we don't balance the bow properly. But it is true that um, as we move to the tip compared to the heel, when we move to the tip, the, the hand also has this kind of pronation movement. And some people, when they get to the heel, that pinky is not so useful anymore, so it kind of flies off. I would, in general, recommend to keep it on as much as possible, uh, just because it makes it easier um, to then, when we go back, to have it there. Otherwise, you might just lose it and then lose contact. Having said that, something that is nothing, something that is not, we're not going to work on today, which is sortie from variation 16 onwards, we can have the pinky a little bit loose. When we work on that, it's a different story because we're not off the string, we're actually on the string. So the, and the pinky the, is not needed on the bow as much. So because we want the hand to be very soft and, 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 and flexible, that pinky kind of flies off many times, even in when I was playing it myself, I noticed it happens to me as well. So in general, I would say keep the pinky on as much as possible, um, unless there's a specific reason like a sorty year, or we are right at the tip and the pinky is not needed. So if you're playing things like at the tip or, no, not lifting, but when we go to the heel, definitely we need the pinky there. I would recommend you to keep it as much as possible. Right, thank you for the comment, that's great. Um, let's continue, let's go to number 10. Please bring me more questions because then it's, it's a lot more interesting to, to, to talk about whatever challenges you're finding. Number 10 continues with the spiccato, that we did before. Uh, we have been in G minor, we'll continue with G minor. And in this case, we want to be in the middle of the string and then on the string, off the string. I would use not very much amount of bow because um, we don't want to get out of the area that we're working, in this case, the middle. Yeah, so I would keep it around the middle as much as possible. Don't use, because then you can't continue. Again, I keep insisting that we need that arm to be higher for the speaker though. And it's pretty much the same for the whole for the whole of the variation. If you have any questions about number ten, let me know. But I will continue otherwise, um, because we're running out of time and we still have a few to do. Um, U H bar eleven, or variation eleven. Um, U H meaning lower half. So 
I would try to do a circle and then off. This is the kind of bowing that is super useful in, well, all of this, but this one in particular, um, in, um, in so, much, so much music, like even Baroque music. That letting go. And then later on, it goes to the middle. So it's on the string and then it goes off the string. We have done this before, it's just more of the same. You see repetition, 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 and also review all those skills. Um, there's a comment by Lillian. Hi Lillian. Um, what, at what stage in the Suzuki books do you introduce Shevchik? That's a very good question as well. Um, and the answer is going to be, it depends. <laughs> But I'm going to give you some guidelines for that too. I think it depends on the stage of the child and how able they are to, to do this kind of bow strokes of the string. Um, but I would say anywhere between book five and six is a great time to start it because we need, we're going to need these skills. So I'm, I'm saying book five because of German dance and uh, very chinegic. So. We need these skills that we just talked about. The lifting, that new level of the arm. Um, same with the jig. And then from then on, there's so many more pieces that um, develops this. Um, you know, those traveling bow variations that we were working on. Um, we have them in uh, book six in Rameau. Uh, with them. Yes, yeah, so those um, up-bow staccatos of the string in Romo can really, really benefit by doing some of this work before. So, what I would recommend is at the end of book five, start introducing this, and then using the fingers and using the new concepts that we are working on here on German dance and Varicini. Um Having said that, of course, we haven't before. Um, but that's just an introduction to those kind of lifted ball strokes. So I think it would be too early to introduce Shepsi Copper Um I'm just looking at these new comments. Uh, number 10, my bow bounces and shakes for the transition off the string to on the string. Um, that's okay, no worries. So, um, thank you for another comment. So, yeah, one of the things I say to my students is that uh, if we want to be flying, you know, if you want to have flying lessons, like we are when we are off the string, we need to make sure that we know how to land. Okay, so landing is a very important concept when we're doing off string. Sometimes we don't need to land, like in spiccato, but as soon as we stop doing that and we need to go back and play on the string, we need to be, be able to land first. So, land, land first and then play. Otherwise, we have that shakiness. That shakiness is going to be something we're going to actually use later when you do That's the nature of the bow. The, the bow is bouncy by nature. So if we don't want it to bounce, in this case, we want to make sure that we are on the string and then play. Land. I hope that makes sense. 
So land and then play on the string. Eventually, that landing is going to be more seamless. But for the moment, I will probably stop, play, and then and then continue. Great. Um, another example of this, number 12. So in this case, lift, bounce, land. Lift, bounce, land. I love this one because it's so different from the other ones. There's a bit of fresh air coming in. And it's not as difficult. It's just lifting, bouncing, and then on the string. But it's super useful for later on, even later. It gets more interesting as well. But um, it's really important to make sure that you use the right amount of both. So be very careful of reading this number 12. OK, we're nearly at the end, and we have three variations left. So I'm going to not speed, but I'm going to just talk briefly about them. Number 13 is one of my favorite spiccato ones, because it's got string crossing as well as spiccato. So it brings back the two ideas that we've been talking about, which is obviously the bounciness, but also the string crossing with the fingers. We don't want to upset the arm too much by doing this. It's just too complicated. So I would say the arm level is obviously high, but also between the G and the D string. And then the fingers help to go from one to the other in a very kind of in the smallest way possible. We have to do a big string crossing, then we do use the arm to go. Oh, this one, oh. especially this one. The finger will definitely help you, and then the arm will catch up. The arm is kind of lagging behind. Also, is kind of helping you to get there before you can anticipate it, but this is it's a slower movement than the fingers. The fingers can do the, the hard work. And in that way, you can get a much more even sound on the spiccato. Um, right. Um, thank you for another comment. Um, how do you not strain your pinky uh, <laughs> after so much? To be honest, um, a few months ago, I did a live stream like this when I played the whole of Chapsy Cooper 3. And I wouldn't recommend it. It's not something I would do normally. Um, even now, you know, talking about this and doing it so much, there is some sort of strain. I think the more you do it, the, the more muscle you're going to get over here, which is going to help you to to hold the ball better. So as in any sort of exercise, start small, start doing a little bit and then increase. Um, I, don't know if, um, I don't know if you already have my PDF, my 10, 10 essential guidelines, but um, let me just show you again. I don't know if you can see it now. Um, if you look in, at the end, the very last one of the guidelines says stop early. <laughs> and that is, that is what it means, don't strain yourself. If you find that it's hurting, stop, stretch. You know, stretching is really good between uh, practices, in the middle of a practice. A stretch, especially the wrist, especially the fingers, so that, you know, they go back to that relaxation that we need for this kind of um, playing. So if it starts hurting after two lines, just stop, do something else, come back and do it again. Or, you know, you can always, if, if you're still learning it, you can always do it on the string, like... And you get the practice of the string crossing as well. And then later on, once you know it, then you can use the spiccato, for example. 
that's another extra strategy not to overexert um, those muscles that are not ready yet. Um, so yeah, that's that would be my my one thing I would definitely do is stop early. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. Let's finish off with the 14 and 15. 14 has combination of what we did before, which is the um, sorry, let me just take this off so you can see me. Um, traveling. At the same time as dropping the bow with the fingers. So it's a bit like spiccato. The arm does the main movement, and we just drop the bow. Sorry, I'm using too much bow. It's only the the lower half. Again, how do you practice? basic one for um, off-string apple staccatos and if you're used to Suzuki or you know the Suzuki repertoire and you use it I would definitely go back to uh, book two and things like use it in the top of minuet in the trios section because this is exactly what it is and then from then onwards, you can use anything you had up or staccato. As a review to work on those up or staccatos. Um, it's very useful to, to know what repertoire you have done already and you can use it again to get something familiar with the new technique. And um, finally, number 15, just because We've been here for an hour already. Um, again, it's spiccato and jete. The difference between spiccato and jete, in my point of view, is that spiccato is more round and jete is a, bit, a little bit more um, throwing the ball in some way. But again, we need that. We've been working on with the fingers. The movement comes from the hand, but the fingers do the, the actual throwing. So this one is completely off the string. There is no um, off the string. I mean, there's no on the string for this one. And then obviously we have um, etc. Uh, we're just looking at the next next line. That's fast spiccato, but still spiccato. If you find any of this difficult, just stay with one note. When you have it. Remember the guidelines, always start with something easy like open strings or one finger, making sure that you're really carefully and you know exactly what you meant to be doing, and then you can continue. Learn the notes separately, put it together, and there you go. The more repetition, the better. But always don't do it too much. If you're going beyond and it starts to hurt, it's time to stop. Pain is just telling you it's moment to stop and reevaluate, do some stretching, and go back. Okay, any final questions from anybody? Uh, because uh, we've been here for an hour and I don't want to take any more time off from you. We did the first 15. Um, the next session is going to be next month, probably. And I'm going to go all the way to number 30, more or less. And then following month, I'll be doing the last 10, because the last 10 are massive, especially the last two. Um, so we'll need more time on that. 
But if you would like to know more on this, and there is a lot more, <laughs> um, I recommend first you get the 10 essential guidelines if you don't have them, because that's going to help you a lot, <laughs> just to remind you what to do and what to do. And two, if you really interested, you can go into the decoding Chef Chico Plus 3 and, and from there we can explore even more because I will give you some exercises on how to lift the arm, how to work on those fingers even more than today. But these sessions are more about checking on you, see how, where you are and how to help you. You know, the questions I had today, they're really, really useful. So um, it's great. Uh, I hope you can you can come back the next month. Um, oh, thank you very much for your comment. I'm I'm glad that you like my channel. Um, if you find it useful, please share it with everyone as much as possible. And thank you, Lillian, as well. Um, it's been great to have your comments here, both of you. And if you are watching this on a replay, just also you can comment, and I will try to answer on a on a written response. Um, but anyway, I hope this was useful. And I'll probably see you next month if everything goes well. So looking forward to seeing you. Goodbye.